welcome to the webinar on uh, uniting diverse community stakeholders using online spaces. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting webinar. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Jamila Kyle. I'm the Customer Success Manager at Open Social, and I will also be your host for this webinar. Um, just a little heads up as well, uh, if you haven't realized, the webinar will be recorded and posted as well, uh, just for you to be aware of that. Uh, you're also currently not visible except our panelists, of course. Uh, of, of course, if you have any questions, have anything to say, you can say that in the chat or in questions and answers, and we will then get to you. First, let me then introduce our guest today. Today's joining is David Messer from the city of Guelph, who will talk about their online community called Our Food Future, um, as well as Sander Hees from the UNDP, who will talk about the International Aid Transparency Initiative community called Yati Connect. I hope, Sander, I said your name right. <laughs> uh, it will definitely be a very interesting discussion where, first of all, I will give a short introduction to Open Social, uh, where then our um, uh, guests today, our speakers, will be presenting their platforms, where in the follow-up, we'll have a little bit of a Q&A between all of us here in the call together uh, to ask some more questions. Um, so before we talk about Yati Connect and our food future and how these communities have managed uh, to bring diverse stakeholders together, I want to quickly introduce Open Social to maybe people who are here who do know, not know Open Social. What is Open Social? Uh, it's an online community software solution with a focus on member engagement and member management. Uh, specifically as a company, we like to focus on helping organizations bringing their members and people together online uh, that helps them manage their community more effectively and empower people to share knowledge and activate and engage their members. It is really a place to centralize all the information for your members where they can connect and learn more as well. It really helps to drive your organizational goals and I think creates a real world impact, um, especially to connect nowadays. Uh, a lot of our clients include NGOs, associations, government bodies, and large multi-stakeholder organizations, such as the UNDP, for example. Uh, so today, we specifically want to talk about this topic of uniting diverse stakeholders, because we see a lot of organizations using open social having this need. Um, online spaces are really good for connecting people from different geographies, companies, organization, industry, and many more places. Um, however, how does open social really try to help connect such organizations? Uh, we really have a lot of features that we hope support connecting different members and stakeholders. Uh, some, for example, are groups, uh, which allows um, community members to co uh, connect around niche topics, which form literally like micro small communities within the platform in itself, which is a community as a whole. Um, also, our flexible group structure allows people to uh, create public, secret, invite only groups. Uh, there are a lot of visibility rights that you can set uh, to create your own specific group. We also have flexible spaces such as topic, pages, dashboards, discussions that allow community members and members to create spaces within community around specific topics, uh, also within groups, uh, but also to share interest and a lot more. We also allow extensions to be added onto the platform to personalize further, such as real-time collaboration, crowd innovation that help bring community stakeholders together and create knowledge through sharing expertise and ideas, uh, such as Wall says also in our future. There are many more features that support the organization further. However, I've talked already quite a bit, well, a couple of minutes. Uh, sorry if I rambled on, I'm a fast talker. <laughs> uh, however, uh, we will now hear from, of course, our two clients as well, how they unite diverse stakeholders on their platform and how they use open social to do so. Uh, first, I'd like to give the word to Sander Hees. He'll be introducing UNDP's platform, Yati Connect, and he will be also sharing his screen to give you a little presentation on that. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Jamila. Um, I think you need to stop sharing so I can share my screen. Great, thank you. Um, I hope everybody can uh, can see my screen. So yeah, my name is uh, Sander Hayes. I am based in the Netherlands and I work as a knowledge management and digital community specialist at uh, UNDP. And in uh, that role, I support the IATI Secretariat. Uh, IATI uh, stands for the International Aid Transparency Initiative, 
uh, which is a global initiative to improve the transparency of development and humanitarian resources and their results to address poverty and crises. And uh, together with development initiatives, uh, an NGO based in the, in the UK, uh, the IATI Secretariat basically supports uh, the initiative on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, then my specific role in this is mostly focusing on managing our community platform, IATI Connect, which is also the topic that I wanted to, um, uh, to, to cover today. Um, and I see my role basically a little bit as a spider in the web, so to say. So I'm involved in technical troubleshooting with the platform to circulating monthly newsletters to keep people informed, uh, the creation of new groups. Uh, everybody uh, will be aware, I think, of all those different roles. Uh, I have, I believe, five minutes in total, so I will try to keep to the to the five minutes, but I thought it would be useful to uh, show uh, you what the platform looks like based on a few screenshots. I didn't dare to do a live demo because live demos always go wrong uh, or the internet connectivity won't be good enough. So I will just do that uh, with uh, a couple of slides that I wanted to show you. First, a little bit of uh, context. Um, so IATI Connect, uh, as I said, is the community platform of the uh, IATI initiative. Uh, it was launched on the 30th of November, 2020. So we are a rather uh, new platform. And um, we started with 250 users and now expanded to uh, nearly 900 members. Those 250 users were basically already members of our initiative uh, that were part of a previous platform. Uh, the goals, and this might sound a little bit abstract, uh, but I will still uh, 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 share them with you. The uh, overall goal is like to provide an informal space to exchange and also engage with colleagues and peers. Um, I will show you what that means on our platform. It is also a platform where we uh, uh, like launch consultations or discussions and ask our members to basically help us shape the future of the initiative and, and its tools. And it's a tool for us, which is very important to expand our own community and, and widen it up a little bit, diversify it, uh, but also enable the users themselves, of course, to expand their own networks and, and uh, basically relate their own position in a, a much wider network of uh, transparency uh, uh, professionals. And then lastly, the launch of collaborative projects uh, or the showcasing of... Uh, of results during some of our events. Um, what you can see here, so um, I would just wanna guide you through like uh, four basic steps uh, on the platform. What you can see here is our, uh, is our homepage, the dashboard where uh, the users can find like all community wide information. Uh, you see like the latest activity stream. Uh, you can see on the right top a highlight of the week where we share whatever is going on and uh, I think this is uh, helpful to keep people informed across the community as we want to prevent that uh, people are working too much in, into their own silos. And um, also you can see the Connect Collaborate is a, is a new extension that we, we launched um, uh, last week, uh, which is basically our own version of Google Docs, so where people can go edit uh, certain pieces of text. Um, then if we go to the next, uh, the step two, basically, as I said, it's super important for our initiative to uh, expand our reach to include more and a more diverse uh, uh, community. So it's important also to onboard those people uh, onto our platform in a, in a proper way. Um, we have a couple of, of things that we do with that. So we have like a lot of guidance materials on, uh, on the platform, uh, FAQs, et cetera. We also organize bi-monthly uh, events, uh, IATI Connect crash courses, where people can ask their questions on how to use the platform, but also a little bit much broader, like what is the initiative and how does it relate to my work and what can it, what can I do for your work? And we launched um, uh, like a newbies group where like the newbies of IATI can also ask questions to each other and, and to us. Uh, the third step, um, and I think this is a, a one of the, the major functionalities or the way we use the platform, 
uh, is very much centered around uh, groups. So we started off with three main communities of practice, as we call them, based on the main constituents that we have, uh, the publishers of uh, IATI data. Uh, we have the data users, so to say, that's often developing countries. And then um, the, the technical community, which is working on the tools, etc. So they form like the main buckets of the communities of practice. And then under those main communities of practice, we have four uh, subgroups. We have four official spaces, for example, for working groups that uh, that come together on the on, on the platform. And then we have uh, four community driven spaces, as I call them. I didn't have a good term for that, but that's mainly uh, groups that really are driven by uh, a member within our community and they want to uh, uh, share knowledge specifically on, in this case, the Netherlands corner on Netherlands publishing guidances, for example. So we also provide space for them to create their own groups and, and, and to keep, uh, keep each other informed on that. Um, then I think, and this is the, if I believe the last slide, the type of content that we use on, on the platform, uh, basically uh, three main types of content, as you might also use this, uh, the, the same three types, but just wanted to flag that. First of all, we have the discussions and also consultations. As I said, we want also some input on, on our initiative or on the tools that we have. So we launch these discussions and consultations uh, uh, with our members, and then we hope to get their feedback on, on, on things. Obviously, we organize events. Uh, uh, as I already mentioned, we have the IATI Connect crash course, but we also have like drop-ins where people can get like uh, uh, direct help on uh, certain questions. Um, and the last part is uh, topics, which we are gonna rename to uh, content, uh, where uh, people are encouraged to share whatever knowledge they want to share and, and also things that we wanna share with our community. Um, I think that's it. I hope I kept to my five minutes. I'm not quite sure, actually, to be honest. Um, I think I will, maybe there's already some questions here or we can leave it up to after David's uh, uh, presentation, but uh, happy to take uh, whatever questions there will be at whatever moment would be, uh, would be best. Yes. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, just submit them and we'll then get to it during the questions part. Uh, but as you've already seen, you can start rolling them in so you don't forget them. But thank you so much, Sander. That was really great. Super helpful as well. I even learned a little bit more about your community as well. Uh, thanks so much for that. Um, now, uh, another community running on Open Social is our Food Future. It's quite actually a different project, uh, but it's similarly a wide range of stakeholders together in one place. Um, David, now the floor is yours to introduce it further, uh, what you do in your community. Sure, uh, I'm just gonna put up my screen here. Unlike Sander, I'm gonna, I'm gonna risk it and do some live stuff, so fingers <laughs> crossed. Um, thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it and, and love talking about this project and, and what we've been able to do uh, through our, our digital platform with Open Social. Um, for those of you who don't know, Guelph is uh, a community about an hour outside Toronto. Um, it's one of the agricultural sort of hubs in Canada. We have the main food university here. And it's a, it's a city of about 150,000 people in Wellington County, which is a big agricultural region um, with a total population combined of about you know, 350 people, roundabout. Um, and our project came about uh, two years ago, just about now. Um, through the federal government of Canada, uh, launched a Smart City Challenge. So 140 communities across the country put in their bids for what they would do to build a smart community. Our pitch was quite different than many of the others that focused on sort of, I guess, traditional things of, you know, sensors in the roads and, and whatnot. And ours focused on building um, a technology-enabled circular food economy. Um, so through this program, we got $10 million from our federal government. Um, and it was focused around three main goals. So uh, increasing access to affordable, nutritious food by 50%. So that's focused on both food security and sort of nutrition. Um, starting 50 new circular economy businesses and collaborations. 
um, and creating a 50% increase in economic benefit where waste is being used as a resource. Um, I didn't really explain the circular economy, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's effectively trying to take you know, the end of use waste at one end and make that an economic feedstock in another economic process. So trying to reduce food waste um, while increasing value, social, economic, and environmental along the supply chain. So it's a very, very, very big project. Um, we have about 150 collaborators that are inside the tent and many more that are broadly involved across our community. Um, and when you look at kind of these three big goals uh, and each work stream that's being led by a different organization like Nutritious Food is being led by our public health unit and business and collaboration are being led by local uh, innovation clusters. It, it's bringing together a lot of people and a lot of stakeholders. I, I think the other thing about it is that um, as a municipal government, we have $10 million to, to play around with within five years. But if we want to do anything that's substantial or lasting, um, we can only do a very small amount of that. You know, when you think of waste, we pick up the waste in garbage, and that's really all we do with it. Um, we support some food banks here and there. But if you want to build a circular economy, we need businesses to be on board and to find collaborations with other businesses and say, hey, I can use that spent brewery grain to as a feedstock for this. Um, we need to work with all the food relief organizations and build links in there around um, access to food and school boards and universities and, and all the rest. We have a tremendous amount of researchers <laughs> working on this project from, the, from three different universities, um, from different, um, uh, different sort of consultants that we've brought on, including Metabolic from the Netherlands um, and many others. So it's a, there's a lot going on. I'll I'm just going to share this next slide that kind of shows these are all the initiatives that have been going on really in the first year. Um, this isn't finalized. We're still kind of building it out. But I just suffice to say there's a few of us who are kind of at the center who understand what's going on elsewhere. But I think there's very few other people who really do. Um, plus, for this to last and make an impact, we need a much broader community. It needs to not just be us. It needs to be a movement. Um, and so that's what really kind of brought us to Open Social as a platform. Just end this, and I'll, and I'll show you um, what our, our site looks like. So when we started, we were looking for a platform that would serve um, as an online innovation portal was, was kind of our focus. So something where we could launch challenges, um, and uh, have members of the community or businesses respond because that's that's kind of one of the innovation avenues that we're taking for this for this whole project. Um, and we looked around at a lot of different solutions, and I think Open Social really suited it because you know it could do that for us um, in a quite easy way. But we also wanted to make it much easier for you know different parts of this network to tell their stories, to to inform the community of, of what's going on and promote circular businesses or particular interventions. And so we needed a much easier way for that to happen than going through central communications at a municipality, which is uh, bureaucratic to say the least. So we needed something much more flexible that we could have as, as a bit of a social network. Um, we also needed to work on internal collaboration. We were using Basecamp for that, which was somewhat successful, but we were really, you know, experiencing sort of platform expansion, um, which, you know, when you're trying to pull together different threads saying, oh no, it's on this platform, not this platform, that it's, gets very, very confusing. And so through this, we were able to really pull things together um, all on one place. So um, I think that has been really um, a success for this platform for us. Currently we have about um, 667 members um, we, you know, uh, there's a lot of, of uptake from people inside the pro the project who use it a lot. Um, we've had, we've run challenges through it where, uh, for instance, we did a challenge, um, last summer where we gave away $108,000 for local urban agriculture projects. And we had a community voting mechanism on that. And we got, uh, I think around 300 votes. Four different projects, which is amazing. It's it's fantastic that 
you know, it's raising awareness about the initiative. And, you know, once we get some of that buy-in, people will think about, about it more. So we started with this platform, which we called the kitchen table, which was kind of this social media type approach. Um, we have discussions and, and blogs about, you know, different circular businesses that, that we're incubating and working with. Um, we talk about events. We have had a, a documentary series that kids made documentaries and we were able to post that up here and promote that through this platform challenges, like I mentioned. Um, so there's been lots of interesting stuff there as well as groups where, you know, people inside the project can provide updates to folks, uh, in the broader community, because it's really trying to hedge between, a a, a local, uh, an internal group and a broader comms vessel. Um, but then, because I think we found it was, you know, flexible, we also kind of made it just our, our main homepage. So we pushed what was our sort of slower comms page onto this. So foofuture.ca is now uh, sort of our main hub built on here, where we have sort of our central comms, our overriding documents across the whole thing, um, all, all within one place. And I also just want to mention kind of our, our internal piece here, where we have um, sort of internal discussions between all of our different work streams where they can, um, these are secret groups that you need um, to be invited to be a part of and they're not visible outside. So we have, we have all these different working groups that are sharing documents that are having discussions that are doing planning within this platform. We also recently, um, we have some university researchers doing um, consultations with focus groups and they're also using this platform for that. And one very last thing, I know I'm over my time. Um, We've recently launched the new digital passport on here. So this is uh, a program for businesses to go through circular economy education. And um, there's a, a range of programs across 20 something collaborators that a business could get involved in, whether it's you know learning about um, social responsibility, learning, le learning about um, you know, how to find collaborators for their particular waste products. And we've created this digital passport program now where they're able to go through these processes and actually get digital stamps that they can use here, they can use on LinkedIn or other places to really show what they're doing. So it's, it's not the only solution out there, um, but I think we've been able to pack a whole lot into it, which is, has been really quite useful. So thank you. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, David. Always love your passion when you talk about our food future. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, really, for that. I appreciate you both giving a little intro on it. I learned a thing about you about both of them as well, and I'm sure all our listeners as well. Like men, David mentioned, you can go ahead and answer your questions. But first, I have a, a couple to ask. And also, David and Sander, of course, you can ask each other also some questions as you just learn more about each other, too. I guess one of the biggest things like I also want to always I'm interested in obviously you both have praised slightly your platforms and anything like that but of course there are also challenges that I'm sure people are interested to hear uh, what that faces so I was also wondering like what is the main challenge your organization faces in bringing these different like stakeholders together and actually making them connect on the platform and how do you do so also um, maybe uh, David since you're still unmuted you can start um I think momentum is challenging and, and make keeping it always there and keeping it fresh and keeping it changed. Um, as I mentioned, there's a huge amount going on. And, and personally, I don't really have time in my own life to just go on websites and look for stuff. Hmm. And so kind of creating those opportunities to pull people in, um, especially from inside the project, so they can go on and hopefully they'll see some other things that are going on in other parts of it. Um, I, I think that's that's a bit of a challenge and, you know, getting on people for sort of, you know, UOS blog, Workstream 1 UOS blogs this week about this yeah. and and trying to, it, it takes some pressure and kicking to, to kind of keep that momentum going. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of the bigger challenges. And when you have something really good, it becomes very easy, but it's just, yeah. you kind of got to scope those out and have a schedule and, and a plan. Yeah. What about you, Sander? How did you experience that? I think in our case, um, what has been a challenge and a, what is still challenging is um, basically channeling in, a, in an effective way the different types of expertise people would have. More concretely, we have a lot of people that, that originally uh, would have like very like technical expertise 
we wanted to widen that up and include like more voices but it's been quite challenging doing that basically like you 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 don't want to like chase away your uh your core user base so to say of like technical developers for example but at the same time how do you attract like new audiences um in 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 such a way that they feel that they're heard and that they can really participate through the platform so i think that's one one thing that we uh, and that's why we have so much emphasis on like how to attract newbies for example and mm -hmm. and and that we offer we try to offer them as much as we can and i think a second thing and that counts i guess for um maybe every platform is i mean it's great to launch a platform and i'm certainly not going to say that we shouldn't do that certainly not today mm -hmm. uh but like i i also think that we sometimes have to do some expectation management in the yeah. sense that sometimes uh, uh some people think that they by launching the platform we now all of it all of a sudden have a thriving community but that's not how it works of course like mm -hmm. the platform is only uh, uh in support of already like an existing community or communities and it, it might sound like a cliche but we often uh we often forget that uh, as we go and i think that that's uh to keep people uh, uh getting on the right track and seeing things in the right sequence of of events i think is is still important and uh yeah i think those two challenges uh uh are um are, are things that uh, that we try to tackle and and lastly i have to say that as i mentioned at the start we launched the, the initiative uh, the 30th of november so we are very much at the beginning of uh of the platform and in our learning and progressing and we try to do some trial and error which is often also maybe that's a third challenge actually we don't allow ourselves as much to uh do to, to make mistakes so to say and to learn from those mistakes we often try to cover it up and by saying like best practices or whatever but certainly some things go wrong and especially when we launch this platform there was a lot of sense of like we need to be flexible with it we need to be more informal with it than we are than we used to be and uh yeah that that, that yeah. that's now uh, uh led to a situation where we try to evolve and optimize the platform and uh need to be open for those kind of uh new things yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I usually say that I talk to clients too. There's right this manage expectations. Like we launch, how is everyone not immediately engaging, right? Without there being engagement, or like what do you then put on? And there are always these expectations to manage. And I always also say the first thing you need to do is really be more flexible. Try things. If you see there's no reaction, do it a little bit differently, um, and see how it goes there. As public feedback is uh, like probably the most important one in general. But you also said like, right, you have people from different things, some are much more communicative than others. So how do you like uh, create like value for people, for example, who are really interested in these, let's say, uh, people who are louder than others? Well, for example, let's say the people are more technical, are definitely more interested not to say something. So how do you really feed uh, interest for everyone, right, since you have such different stakeholders? Yeah, that's that's uh as i said that's one of one of the one of the challenges and and mm -hmm. and also the thing is that you don't want to uh not create a space for people who really want to dive into like super technical kind of discussions you know mm -hmm. so we still have like spaces for for those people so we still mm -hmm. have groups with like the technical community for example where they can share information with each other on how to optimize the tools of mm -hmm. our data bank and i mean i never really understand those kind of discussions either but these people are so are so technical so you should you should really provide them that space what we do try to uh, uh launch more and more is um, some kind of like body mechanisms so that's one of those collaborative projects that we're working on where we connect like already experienced publishers to new publishers to our da data bank so they can like learn from each other and, and ask each other these questions and there is a there's a there's a big sense of like uh like people are willing to share that information um with each other and mm -hmm. um but that like yeah we uh and and one last thing that i wanted to say on that like um as we see as we use our platform primarily through these groups we need to also prevent that those groups are going to be like really uh like uh very closed off groups you know uh so we try to launch uh the um uh, like cross posting feature that allows us also <laughs> to create discussions between different kind of groups that we have on the platform of data users and publishers for example and then 
try to learn from each other in, in that way. But I, I, I will admit that it's still an ongoing challenge. Mm, yeah, for sure. But how do does Van Gogh, for example, use these challenge feature, for example, to create that collaboration or, as you mentioned, conser- uh, conversation between members, as you also obviously have secret groups, just like Alessandra mentioned, creating these groups for people to interact. Uh, but how do you, for example, use that challenge feature to increase that or increase conversation between members? Um, I think for us, I mean, there needs to kind of be stakes. So we're fortunate when we, when we do challenges that we typically have money, um, Mm -hmm. that we can put forward. And and so, you know, we're looking for innovations or input or something from the community and there'll be an actual investment in it. So Mm -hmm. that, that gets everyone really keen to talk about it, frankly. (laughs) Um, but, but then I think within that, you know, getting people to dive down deeper, managing, you know, trying to get people to collaborate and not just think about their project or their interest or their thing um, is something that we that we need to work to do and, and ma- try and make engagement a little deeper than just kind of clicking a like. And mm. so so it's not that they go in once and because this community garden that they work with said, please go here and vote for us. Um, that after that, you know, we can get more engagement, more discussion from them in, in other parts of the project um, yeah. is some of the challenges that I think we're facing and, and trying to trying to grow. Yeah. Well, going back a little bit, Matthias just also posted a question is, his question is, what did you do to attract new members to the platform and activate them actually even getting them there? Want me to go first? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, I think the more that we centralized uh, across, you know, we had a whole bunch of platforms at the start of this, the more that we centralized, the more the people came there. Um, and then internally, we kind of made it the one channel where we would do things internally, which helps get, you know, probably 300 plus people who use this regularly um, to use it because that's where they need to go for information, for agendas, for whatever else they're doing. Um, and so that helps pull people there. Um same thing with some of our business services. So when we have, you know, this business passport opportunity, um, that runs kind of through this. And so, you know, so we're using a lot of these mechanisms, again, sort of tied to money or projects or opportunities to really say, you know, this is the channel that we'll feed through. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from that, hopefully get more people involved in the community. Yeah. Getting engagement is hard. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, getting people to want to want to share is, is tricky, but you know, the more that sort of, I think people inside the project prime the pump, the more that we get feedback and reaction. And when people see that actually this is a community and actually things are happening that, you know, there's all these amazing circular interventions or businesses happening, people will go and read and respond and, and talk about it more. Yeah. And just to just to in addition to what David's just saying, and it was also kind of the things that I noticed from uh, from your your platform was I think that the really engaging way of how you deal with like information sharing, like for I saw you you've created a podcast, for example, we are really in the process of also looking into not just like what kind of message we want to share, but like the way we share that kind of uh, message and and repeating that message, of course, which also helps to draw in new audiences, I guess. So I, I was also wondering if those kind of new means of, of communication, so to say, uh, helped you in expanding your community or whether that's what, that was already something that existed. Did, did that draw in new audiences or was that not, not kind of something that would result in that? You mean specifically sort of centralizing communications through it? Yeah, but also like the, 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 new, the new ways of communicating communicating your message like through podcasts for example I saw I think a lot of videos as well and making it easier to access your information and and tapping into maybe new audiences definitely I think um because I think the sort of communications approach when when this started a year ago was basically city hall makes an announcement that goes out in a press release to the two local websites and a couple local papers across the region. Like it's, it, it's not huge. Um, and, and that's not necessarily enough. I think people pay attention if you live in a medium-sized community of what's going on. Um, but 
it's not flexible, it's not dynamic, it's written in one font and posted on one website very cryptically. So I think, yeah, it, it creates way more flexibility for us. And then to your point, yeah, it does invite us to start doing podcasts and start, you know, posting videos and sort of pulling all of that stuff into one place, um, which I think generates much more engagement. And, and it, it also, it's cool because when we did this really amazing food flow study um, with metabolic, um, it, where, you know, they basically tracked food material flows across the entire region, identifying all the food produced and where all the waste goes. And it's, if anyone goes to our website, it's right on the front page. It's a really actually pretty incredible piece of work. Um, and when we post that on LinkedIn or other social things, it pulls all sorts of people here who see all sorts of other things. And so it's, it's just really useful to sort of centralize and also create opportunities for, for engagement, which I think don't typically exist in other government um, communi communities. Mm. Yeah. How did uh, you do that now uh, with onboarding? And you're super new, so this was very fresh, yeah. right? Like starting onboarding of new members. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, as I, as I said, that, that's kind of, uh, that was one of the main purposes of our platform. Uh, I have to admit that right now, when it comes to our like digital footprint, it's quite fragmented. So we don't have like in the in the example of Guelph, everything on one platform. We have like our tools are on certain plat uh, on on certain websites. Our uh, official website is somewhere else. And I think bringing the, that together to one place will also help us drive traffic to the platform, obviously. But at the same time, uh, yeah, the, 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 the increase of the current uh, user base from like 250 to 900 in like uh, about half a year has been quite, quite impressive and has been quite successful in a way. And I think mostly in our case, it, it relates to the fact that we've been using like an offering also space for our members. So we, we have like uh, the, 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 the group functionality on our platform and uh, we now have a space for Dutch publishers that are connected to the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs that's like a group of I think 175 publishers or something that those kind of the creation of new spaces and being very flexible with that and and offering support to our members who want to uh, want to have such a space and bringing that together centralize that 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 kind of community engagement it has been very helpful in uh, in, um, in in driving more more users to our uh, to our platform but we're also looking into um, um, like uh, creating well when I say strategic partnerships it sounds much more formal than it is in practice but to to see uh, where we relate to other kind of networks that we can uh, collaborate with for example like open contracting partnership is su such a such an organization that we try to collaborate with. And then as an end result, we wanna have like a, a joint group. And then those people hopefully would also start using the, 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 the platform. So we, we're trying to do that kind of outreach now. And um, uh, as, as often happens within the UN system, you need to have like a lot of strategies before things are starting moving. So we're working on an outreach strategy, um, trying to get, uh, get a better, view on um, where those kind of strategic partners are or potential new users. And um, yeah, but we, we've, we've exceeded actually our own expectations when it comes to the amount of users on the platform. So that's, um, I think, good, good mm -hmm. to see. That's great, glad to hear. I'd, I'd, kind of say, I'd kind of say, just, just to add on that, from also working in sort of a, a bureaucracy, the platform has been really good for helping us bypass a lot of that too. Because once you yeah. set it up and once you kind of get the go that anyone can add anything onto this thing, it's it's a social network, it's we're trying to get a movement, that's the whole point. It becomes much more flexible and you you just need to go through way less of those hurdles from, yeah. from just my, my kind of government perspective. And that's why that's why I think this was appealing compared to sort of other options. Yeah, that that that, that definitely uh, is the case uh, with us as well. And uh it, it, it allows us more to work with trial and error than we usually feel comfortable with. When we have like these communities, when they were set up, they were really uh, primarily set up to be like self-organizing. And you know, it's, in practice, it doesn't always work like that, obviously, as we know, but like 
uh, it, it does allow for some more flexibility than we uh, than we normally uh, than we normally have. So uh, definitely, it helps to have such a platform in this case. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess also now, since you are both obviously working on the platform, right, uh, David, you obviously have, have other people working on it too, Sander, you probably as well as well. Um, how much does a community manager, like probably in the beginning more than later, so it is interesting to see one is a year advance, one a couple of months, uh, how much does the community facilitate this formation of groups, conversations, connection, as opposed to letting the community, like, let's say, organically form and grow? Like, have you found the balance? What do you think is the ideal balance and how has it been in your experience you like yeah um so i think you know going back to that we have mon the fact that we have money helps um and so all of our collaborators who you know we're funding in this in this project yeah. um you know we had to pull them all into it and i think you know, for the community manager, it was very challenging at the start, I think, to get people to try and change the way that they're working, especially since they were on base camp before, which frankly wasn't that effective. And people have their own ways of working in their own organizations and everyone falls back on email. Um, so certainly on the internal side, it was some work to try and push people in here and make that happen and make people start thinking that, you know, you should be making content for this. And that's a part of um, this whole initiative. If we want this to live or be anything, you got to be a part of this thing and make this space grow, especially during COVID, where, you know, it became way more important that we have a, an active digital community because we couldn't do any of the events or, you know, in-person outreach we were, we were planning. Mm -hmm. So, so that was really effective. And then, then the other thing that I think um, we did early on was having those big challenges that were, yeah. were quite broad. You know, one of the finalists in that urban agriculture piece, oh, uh, actually two of them were different um, seniors communities in town. Mm -hmm. And so we had all sorts of people signing on who were, you know, seniors who wanted to vote to get $2,000 to expand the herb garden in their, yeah. you know, seniors community. And they all went on and got all their friends to vote and all figured it out. And so, you know, it's just doing things like doing things like that really kind of at an event level created something to pull a lot more people in at the very yeah. start. Um, some of that has waned, but I think, I think you need sort of instances like that to yes. sort of create that excitement. And did they like start posting themselves or is that still something you a little bit struggle with, with them actually taking some initiative? I think it's, we, they mostly like things, sometimes ask questions on things. Um, you know, we get, we get people who look and read. We, we, get, we don't get necessarily a ton of, um, you know, people saying their statuses, but we get, we get businesses saying, hey, this is a new thing we're doing. Check it out. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so there's lots of other stuff coming in like that. Um, but yeah, it's never as much as you want because it's not Facebook and people have that for their own thing too. And yeah. Yeah, for sure. How Just about, one, one, one question for, for David on this, because I, I see you, uh, you use the, the challenges on your platform, which I think is a, is a great interactive way of like crowdsourcing ideas, etc. Do you think that like when we talk about capacity and, and, and how that, that works on the platform, does, does that need like strong, moderation efforts in your experience or did it did it really go like self organically and people would 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 come up with their ideas in in in, in that we are thinking about using challenges as well we don't do it yet uh, but i was just wondering uh, what are the considerations when you want to want to go in 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 in, in that uh, in that direction um yeah we we ha we've used it mostly for things where we've been giving out money which as a government creates a bunch of different things. So uh, we couldn't just solicit ideas through there. We, we, had, we had the application platform on open social. So we embedded you know, the form where all these people would apply, but then we had to do a short list and then people could vote on the short list. And so that was kind of it. Um, but I think because of kind of procurement and a bunch of different things, it's, it's tricky from a government to, um, do those sorts of challenges just straight in the open if you're going to just to completely crowdsource. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, and I mean, there's been some other places where we where we've been thinking about doing that, but it's it's just finding the right balance. And I think, yeah. honestly, if if it's something that we're going to provide funding for, that drives the incentive to feed in on it. Um, yeah. And we haven't really done others lately where we've gotten you know just crowdsource open ideas and then people go on it. So that's hopefully in the future, but just it hasn't been our focus. At yeah. Present. Yeah. So. Yeah, we've seen uh, many clients as well, like other clients of ourselves, really use it as crowdsourcing as well, like a policy kitchen and so forth, as well as Alpach challenges, where their focus point is as well, challenges where they like crowdsource um, uh, ideas as well, like really from the button up. And it was also, I always think it's a really good way to give engagement because it lets people ideas like encourage there maybe be a winner, different phases. And since these phases are automatic, it really allows things to be less let's say community manager wise because it is all about like people people incentives i just think the challenge needs to be really good and that's just something always to really think about further rather than just throwing in any challenge out the window and of course david you guys always have a really thought out uh, um a challenge as well and especially also with our other communities they really have like this thing they want to get to like the policy kitchen having a policy paper at the end so rather than just throwing something out but really having um, I think we lost Sander. Did we? Yeah. Oh, he's back. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, but yeah, so I think that always kind of uh, really helps. Uh, but what has been your experience, Sander, uh, since we'll come back? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I dropped out. I, uh, <laughs> can you repeat the question for me, please? Because... Uh... Of course. Of course. Um, like, how uh, does... Uh, do you facilitate, let's say the amount of making users, let's say all the work you need to do to initiate groups, conversation, connection. Yeah, so I think um, as, a, as a community manager, also of uh, like a manager of the, of, of the platform, what is uh, uh, quite, what's becoming quite challenging now uh, compared to like other platforms uh, that also use the open social recipe, such as uh, Spark Blue is also, a UNDP uh, hosted platform. Um, like many of these kind of platforms, they have like uh, moderators for each group or for specific discussions, etc. Uh, we okay. don't have that capacity at this at this point. And what what we see is happening is like our our user base is growing, but like it's overstretching a little bit where I don't oversee all communications that are happening within within all our our groups. It does fit a little bit in our like initial thinking when launching the platform that everything uh, has to be like self organizing in a way. So as I said before, like we've been very supportive in the creation of new groups, for example. And once those groups are are alive, then there's like it's up to that group themselves to to form their own uh, uh, kind of conversations. Yeah. Um, so yeah it is it, it, we don't really have a strong hand in like the 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 like uh, specific discussions we do use it also as a platform where we share information yeah. as as an initiative or as a secretariat uh and we don't really have anything that we uh that we like offer in the sense of like resources or funding or or, or something like yeah. that it's it's really primarily knowledge sharing and expanding your own network and uh, providing yeah. us with feedback on how we can do better. Yeah, uh, for sure, especially, um, uh, it is also though interesting, um, I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> uh, what I was thinking is I read a question that came in, so I'm just gonna go there uh, and then maybe it will pop back in my head. But there was a question <laughs> from Martin uh, Levin who said, we've had issues with the search function on this platform like open social, uh, what tools do you use to streamline the search function? Do you organize the posts or information, let's say topic in that sense or content on the platform into well-defined categories? I'm guessing here more content tags or things like that. Yeah, we've been using uh, uh, likes or, or, or like try to introduce the uh, tags system that uh, that everybody uh, has, I think, and that everybody's using, I guess, on the on the platform. So that is helpful in, in channeling uh, the right type of content into the right type of, of categories that people can can find. But we're also in the process of um, 
of setting up our resource library in a bit of a better um, uh, in a better way. Uh, but the tags do help us in in in, in organizing that well. Mm. Do yeah. you organize the? Uh, sorry, David, but do you organize the tags? Let's say in a thematic base, or in what kind of way, or do you put all the tags in one function? Yeah, so we know we have like uh, four different ways in which we streamline that. So we have like the uh, the thematic way indeed, but we also organize it uh, on the uh, group that is taking place in. So you can like specify a little bit more on the, on that or the, the, the type of content uh, and whether it's like an active thing or it's an archived. Uh, piece of content because we, as I said at the start, like we have a, uh, we used to have another platform that we now uh, uh, migrated to yeah. to our new platform. So there's a lot of old content, so to say, but people still want to find that. So we had to think about that as well. Interesting. What about with you, David? Um, very similar, just tagging, um, <clears throat> and then I think just making sure we arrange the page so that mm. people see what we want them to interact with. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the search function isn't like, if you're in an internal group, you know how it's organized. Uh, but if you're sort of a mem member of the public, we try and just make the page refreshed, um, uh -huh. pretty regularly. So I've never received any issues with the search function particularly, but yeah, similarly we use tagging. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you so much. And maybe uh, if anyone has one last short question uh, or we'll slowly uh, proceed. Um, I'll see if something pops up. But um, yeah, thank you so much for both of you. Uh, do e any of you have still a question? Um, I not really, maybe a super basic mm -hmm. question actually, but to, to David, like how often uh, do you actually engage with your community through your platform? Is it like on a daily basis or do you like, I mean, I can imagine that it that it depends on 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 which uh, which phase you're in, but do you try to restrain yourself from communicating too often and sending people uh, information through your platform, or do you just like how often uh, do you engage with your people? I think it's a mix. Um, I think because our role is kind of at the center and we're overseeing all of it, rather than you know trying to implement specific things. It, it means we kind of need to sort of stay on top of different parts and talk to specific people about specific things. Um, so not as much as I like, I wish I was, I had more time and resources to dive in on specific topics, but that's where, you know, all of our different collaborators who are doing interventions can really dive in and plan and work and report. And so it's, it's more, a bit of a hierarchy of, of work, I think. Um, but because there's other people who are posting on it once or twice a week, um, which depends on your role, kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think it's always helpful to have some kind of, let's say, ambassadors. Also, now I remember my question also regarding your groups, like who should be, let's say, uh, working on them or managing them. I also think like having actually your members managing them, which is what is the feature that exists, or having someone who is very, uh, let's say, interactive or wanting to be, like you said, there's some people that are very loud, actually making them group manager or making them people who like to post, I think can be uh, always quite as well helpful and like giving off some of your shoulder. Um, yes. Uh, Maybe then uh, one short thing also to add, of course, uh, that have come uh, to just ex uh, explain as well. But thank you so much, both of you, for answering all the questions. Um, I'm sure you heard quite a bit of like extensions coming through. Some people don't know that some that were mentioned are extensions or what is like, let's say, resource library or crowd innovation, everything like that. We have, of course, all this information further um, on our website as well. We also have really exciting new extensions coming up that. Uh, um, that will help also different stakeholders and different members to connect further, uh, such as organizational profiles, which will allow organizations to completely have their own space and organization and for them to share with their members 
or customized content access that allows like specific members to see specific things, uh, which uh, creates new roles and allows people, let's say, to segment them, especially if you all these stakeholders as well, a little bit more. Um, and our newest feature that is not fully even released yet is monetization that really creates different subscription with different types of members, like hobbyists versus professionals, and they see different things and all of these things that really, let's say, um, uh, showcase different stakeholders and different platforms as well and give them their own space um, and not just group in that sense. Uh, and uh, also, if you have any more questions, of course, we're running our last two minutes as well. Uh, you can definitely go on a community talks if you're uh, as well a um, community manager of Open Social, where we can have afterwards a discussion. You can contact David or Sander, uh, post to them. You can find them for sure on community talks if you have any further questions on that. Also, everything we discussed as well as our recording will be found there. Uh, everyone new, you can also get onto our website, see the extension. Uh, go to their websites as well um, on getopensocial.com as well. You can sign, uh, find some further showcases if you're interested to see a little bit more on that. Again, Senator David, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really great, very interesting, and I hope everyone listening is very interested too. Uh, this uh, webinar will then also be posted uh, and you'll find more information then there. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, I guess till we close, it will be the last minute. Uh, Marty, if your question could go straight to Community Talks if you wish to. I'm sure everyone will be straight to answer. Uh, sorry for not reaching out there further. But thank you so much, everyone. I wish you all a lovely, let's say, morning slash afternoon. Uh, and talk to you all very soon. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Thank you so much. Take thank care. You. Bye. Bye.